Hi everyone, it's Ricky Molina from the Ricky Molina YouTube channel. Today's video is in continuation with a series that I started a few weeks ago on producing and arranging songs. Today's video is a continuation of the Trevor Horn series. And as you remember, in a previous video, I discussed Trevor Horn's production and arrangement of a song by Seal called Love's Divine. So you should check out that video. It's actually quite interesting. Um, there's some very neat techniques that are used. Uh, from a production and arrangement standpoint. In today's video we'll be talking about Seal's song which Trevor Horn produced called Crazy. And as you can imagine with a title like that you probably have to pull some pretty neat tricks in terms of special effects out of your bag to live up to the expectations of a title like that. And um, Trevor Horn uh, uses some pretty incredible innovative uh, special effects in the song and we're going to discuss them. As far as referring to the song that I'm I'm going to be discussing you should refer to the version because there are several versions of the song. There are abridged versions, extended versions, remasterings, uh, but the, the version that I'll be referring to is the one that's off of this album called The Best 1991 to 2000, I'm sorry, 1991 to 2004 Seal's Best uh, Collection and it's the version that goes for 5 minutes and 56 seconds, so almost uh, 6 minutes altogether. In the last video, I showed you how to approach song from an arrangement perspective. And what I did was I revised the spreadsheet that I used in the previous video. So it's, it's, it's really neat. You can see, for example, the arrangement of a song from scene to scene. And that's what I encourage you to do if you're arranging or producing a song. You should actually write down you know, a schematic like this. This is kind of like a blueprint, if you will, uh, from an arranger's standpoint and a producer's standpoint. Because like a film director who directs actors to come into the scenes and to wear certain, certain types of clothing and um, to appear in a certain way, um, and to speak and act in certain ways, a song producer will instruct the musicians and the players, uh, as well as the programmers, as far as how what what instruments and, and effects he or she wants as the producer, and how they come in and off stage, as far as the uh, listening stage is concerned. And we have a stage here that has a center front. Uh, mid the midsection and in the far we have the far back area for um, distant type of sounds. Now you also have uh, stage left and stage right and that has to do with your listening perspective uh, out of the left and right ear and if you listen to a song on headphones you can especially uh, hear the uh, the effects in your ear quite quite clearly. I'm going to include this spreadsheet as a link uh, below this video so you can click on it and download it off of Google Drive. So it's a very useful spreadsheet that you can use as, as a reference guide. One of the interesting things about Trevor Horn's productions is that he likes to break down the song into scenes. Kind of like a film director once again has different scenes for different moments in, the, in a film. Um, well Trevor Horn uses the same type of approach and he, each scene is different as far as the, the instruments that come on stage and how they how they interact with one another and then they sort of disappear and then they come back later on etc. The entrances and the exits of the instruments and the effects is quite interesting from scene to scene. One of the questions you may want to ask yourself is why break down a song into so many different scenes? It's very similar again to watching a movie. Uh, if everything stays the same as, as is the case with certain plays for example where they have just like one setting and it's for the whole play or for three acts it, get, it gets kind of tiring. The, the viewer and the listener definitely want to, to stay interested in the, in the development, the progression, and the way you do it is you, you create different scenes and, and different chapters of the song, different moments of tension and release and build up, and, and that's really key, if you, especially if you want to write a pop, pop song. So what I've done is I've broken down the spreadsheet into different scenes, and as you can see, different instruments come in and out and are emphasized in certain scenes and then the next scene they may disappear and the arrangement is totally different. 
So as you can see, this particular song, I've noticed that there are 17 different scenes in the entire song. But 17 scenes is quite a lot. So you're looking at about like 10 to 20 seconds per scene. It's also important to note that some of the scenes are actually quite similar to the previous ones. So they're not all totally different from one another. But I would say that of the 17 scenes, at least uh, 12 are different from one another. So he has like 10 to 12 really different types of scenes and scenarios. And five of them are really four to five of them are really kind of like rehashes of previous scenes but they're slightly different so I, I I consider that to be a separate scene. Some producers like to break things down according to the structure of the song which refers to the intro and verse one, verse two, chorus, uh, instrumental part or verse three and then break middle eight, chorus three, um, maybe chorus four and then an outro. That type of setup is pretty standard when it comes to pop songs. But when it comes to Trevor Horn's productions particularly, I like to just you know forget about structure necessarily because the scenes are changing even within structures. So you could have like two or three different scenes inside of a verse or a break part or in a chorus you'll have at least two different scenes sometimes in Trevor Horn's productions. In the previous video I mentioned uh, in Love's Divine I mentioned that Trevor Horn really likes to pay attention to the lyrics so he produces around the world that is coming to the fore from from the text or from the lyrics. So in this case the song's title is Crazy so you can imagine what a producer must be thinking about um, and one of the things you may ask yourself if you were assigned to the task of producing a song with such a title how would you produce and what instruments and special effects would you use uh, in producing uh, a song that is really talking about the avant-garde off-kilter you know sort of non-normalcy and um, you know there, there are many different ways to to do that in in music and one of them is uh, like you know you talk about the atonal composers from the 1900s like Schoenberg, Bartok mm. for example you have dissonance you have atonality so there's no tonal center necessarily in the song well that really isn't the case in this song really I, there is a tonal center and it's a minor chord it's E minor and it's E minor 7 E minor 9. So pretty much an E minor is what we're dealing with here. There are definitely um, you know breaks from that and and there, um, there are interludes as well but it's it really kind of centers around the E minor, E minor 7. It's a pop song so we can't get too atonal. Um, we're not going to be dealing with modes here and, and weird developments musically. We're, the way Trevor Horn is dealing with uh, craziness is really through the use of special effects. So let's start out with the song in uh, scene one. Here we have scene one and I've noted it as uh, zero seconds to the 17th seconds. This is the intro part of the song and the lyrics come in and we hear a synth flute like ostinato which gradually increases in volume. We have synth pads we have guitar synth plucked, similar ostinato pattern as the flutes, and we have the vocals up front. Uh, nothing too radical yet, but it's getting weird pretty quickly. Okay, you hear the synth pad coming up in volume. It's like the, as a conductor. Let's play conductor here for a second. The synth pads are coming up. They're swelling. You hear the guitar synth off to the side. That's really just an A minor um, played in the uh, on the seventh fret here with the root on the fifth string. It's just going around uh, quickly. I'd also like to point out that the synth flute-like ostinato offset by the guitar pluck synth in E minor is kind of like suggestive of a, a two-voiced person here. 
that we're not just dealing with one singularity here. We're dealing with potential schizophrenia or madness, as the title of the song is trying to convey. And Seal's uh, lead vocals start center, but then they kind of move out, out wide, pan left and right, and then they come back in. So there's a lot of panning going on here. That's a special effect in itself. So let's listen when the vocals come in. Here we get an ostinato orchestral hit. And the organ arpeggio comes in. You hear the organ? And now the drums and the bass come in. So the second scene is uh, where I, you hear the orchestral hit. Okay, so one first things first. A wah pedal is, um, if you want to listen to what an a wah pedal is supposed to sound like, the classic example is from Isaac Hayes' theme from Shaft. So you could pick that up and listen to it, and it's a great way to learn how to get used to the sound. But um, I've got my little stomp box here and with my wah pedal. Okay, so what I'm doing, I'm, I'm just pressing on the pedal as I'm strumming certain parts of the chord. And, you ha and the trick when it comes to wah pedal playing is... You really have to experiment with the timing of the step of the foot. As my right foot is kind of like pressing down on the pedal, you'll hear how the frequencies of the chord change radically. And this special effect is used throughout the song, not, you'll, you'll hear it kind of tastefully used throughout the song to create the sense of like craziness, abnormality. Okay, so then you hear um, the organ after the orchestral hit, you hear an organ circular arp pattern, LFO suite. That's basically the organ that's coming in. And it's sweeping across from right to left. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And there's an LFO sweep with with which is a synth a synth uh, tweak that's being adjusted. It's sort of like a dial that's being adjusted to again play with the frequency. So we get that special effect, and uh, we start out not with the drum kit, but with a sandpaper industrial beat kind of coming up the middle, building up. And that's kind of interesting in itself, how you have this sense of like the world that this protagonist is living in, um, is living in this industrial world that's kind of like, you know, very unnatural. Okay, so we live in a society that is pushing the limits and is, and is becoming unnatural for the protagonist. To live in so that's kind of an interesting way I see the the use of an industrial kind of sandpaper type of beat coming in before the bass and the drums come in so let's take a listen to that again real close let's start from the beginning here you have the synth flute parts the guitars coming in here Suspension, orchestral hit, and here's the organ and the industrial beat. And now the bass and drums come in. Okay, so that's really cool. How the bass kind of and the drums kind of pick up everything and just pull us right in. It's got a groove now. Um, and that starts out, um, you know, uh, where you have the rock drum kit that comes in in 27 seconds in. You have that organ circular R pattern moving from right to left, and the synth is kind of giving us the bed across the background here. So as soon as the bass and the drums come in and you get this groove, you kind of get the effect as though, you know, we're in a pop song, pop rock environment. We're not disco, we're not um, orchestral, we're not new age. Uh, we're we're rock pop, okay. That's that's very important. He's kind of setting the tone, and then you have the the chords of the song, which for the verses. This is really where where the verses come in. Uh, the chords are really E minor, G, and then A sus four to A sus two, 
Okay, that's that's an A with a sus. A sus four. A sus two. A major. So we go from E minor to G A sus. Okay, so that that sus chord is really kind of. It leaves things kind of open and unsettled, unresolved. So that's kind of neat from a compositional standpoint. Okay, so in the verse, verses 1 and 2, this is uh, scene 5, 37 seconds to a minute 14 into the song. We have the lead vocals with a slightly plated reverb, that's center stage, and the background vocals are panned right and left, have a little more reverb to them. And uh, you'll hear the background harmonies coming in, uh, when he says, I see you, my friend, and touch your face again. Okay, that's a very key moment. Everything else is pretty much standard. You start hearing, I would say, you start hearing, in addition to the wah rhythm guitar, the wah pedal, you have a heavy chorus or flanged electric rhythm guitar pan far right. That's kind of cool. Okay, so here's a an example of a, a wah guitar. <laughs> And again, the example that you should refer to is the Isaac Hayes theme from Shaft as an introduction to how to use wah guitars. Um, but here's a, an example of a wah guitar. points in the strumming pattern so and that's something you have to just build up a feel for uh, experiment with different timings of your right foot as you're strumming um, and you'll get different effects at different moments it really only comes by trial and error so you really have to play around with the wah pedal uh, action as you're strumming take some practice it doesn't come that easy actually um, here's an example of a of a chorus guitar. That's an example of a chorus guitar. Here's a flange guitar. And a flange guitar is really more radical sounding. It's kind of play, playing with the phase shift of the frequency. So it sounds like you're being spun around the room as you're playing. So here's a flange guitar. <laughs> Okay, um, we're in scene five right now, verse one, two, um, and here we have the arrangement. It's pretty much the same as the beginning of when the bass and the drums come in. One of the things I like to point out here is on the vocals. Two pretty cool things are going on. When Seal is singing the verses here, I notice that at the end of one phrase and he begins the next phrase, he'll start using, like, there's this sort of breath or pant effect from the lead vocalist. So you hear something like, I don't know how else to put it, but it's like a breath effect. And if you pay close attention, it's kind of like emphasizes the the entrance of the, of the beginning of the next phrase. It's a very cool effect. And the other thing is pay attention to the background vocals where they're harmonies, but they're dissonant harmonies. They're really not nice harmonies. They're kind of like giving you a sense of tension and dissonance. 
Um, so let's listen to that up until um, minute, uh, one minute and 14 seconds in. Okay, here we go. Okay, so but did you notice how the breaths came in there in between the phrases and then the background vocals really give you the sense of dissonance. It's not really like melodic stuff going on here. Okay, in the chorus. Chorus is a very important part of the song. It tends to be louder than the rest of the, of the verses and it's certainly louder than the intro. Um, so the volume picks up quite significantly during the chorus. Um, during the chorus, we don't hear the organ circular arc pattern. That's really kind of like perfect for the verses and the buildups, but not in the chorus. So you don't hear the organ arp going on. You still hear the heavy chorus electric guitars and the wahs going on. You got that heavy, nice groove going with the drums and the bass. And at the end of the uh, chorus, you hear the, the background vocals with the crazy coming in. So you hear like crazy pan wide left and right. And that's kind of neat. You hear that breath interjection coming in at the beginning of phrases during the chorus as well. Um, in terms of the chordal structure of the chorus, we have a C chord going to a G to a D and at the end to the A sus. So that's like... No, we never go survive. And the... And the D is played actually like I'm hearing it like this. So he's got, instead of the D and the bass, he's got the open A string. And he's got a D played in this position. So it's not this, this version, as you know. We've got an open E string. And he's got the F sharp with the third finger here on the fourth string. A, D, um, and the open E string. Um, and that's the first time around, so it's but no one ever gonna survive Get a little You can play a C with a G bass. But no one ever gonna survive A sus back to the E minor for the verse, the next part, the next verse. So in um, the lyrics to um, verses three and four come in in scene seven, and notice it's really, if you listen to it closely, you'll notice that um, you have some plated reverb on the vocal, um, and they're, they're doubling up, and there's fifths on the harmonies. Um, background vocals are very kind of strange, panned, reverbed, panned right and left again. You still have the chorus guitars and the wahs and everything else is pretty much the same. It's really kind of like in verses 3 and 4, the special effects are coming in through um, for the lead vocal and on the reverbs and harmonies. Okay, uh, which again are kind of dissonant sounding. They're kind of fifths and even off uh, dissonant sounding uh, chord formations. So it's really like. That's what he's kind of doing with the harmonies. Um, it's dissonant. So what do we have there? That's a fifth. So listen to the the dissonant harmonies, the fifths coming in on the lead vocals uh, here at the at the beginning of verse three. Okay, so it's only during the first line of the third verse that you hear the background vocals coming in with the dissonant fifths. 
Okay, um, I won't go through every scene of the song. I just wanted to talk about the important changes, the important, really the notable uh, changes in the scenes. And one of them occurs in scene nine, very important, where all of a sudden you get kind of like a breakdown. Um, all the instruments kind of like quiet down. You're left with a hand shaker, uh, a heavy bass note on a low piano, background vocals. You have a snare drum, but it's a wet plate. You have ethnic toms coming in and very notable reversed cymbals on the hi-hats and on the background vocals. But that's very reminiscent of a Peter Gabriel album, Rhythm of the Heat, from the 1970s when he first went solo. After leaving Genesis, Peter Gabriel had this album that came out called Rhythm of the Heat, was where it was really very rhythmical African um, rhythmic beats that are, you know, to the fore. And in that album, there's this use of reverse vocals. And um, Trevor Horn, uh, no doubt, listened to that album when he produced um, this particular scene. So this is a very important scene in the song. It's it's really kind of a, a breakdown from the from the groove. Okay, so the very very stark change of a scene here. Scene nine. Let's listen to it. Two forty three to three oh one. Okay, so that's very much like Peter Gabriel. I would even venture to guess that that's Peter Gabriel himself, but um, sampled. It could be. It could be. It could be Seal. Um, mostly, I don't know. I, I, I'm just. It sounds so much like the Pitt Gabriel album, though. Scene ten follows this Peter Gabriel part of the song. It's significantly quieter than the other parts of the song, and it's kind of like a reflection moment pay attention to the eerie howls in the distance you know that's very special that's a special effect in the far distance so we're uh, you even hear these howls they're kind of like werewolf howls way off in the distance so we're we're in a crazy world no doubt uh, synth pads are still going a little bit off uh, center left uh, drum kits are slightly plated um, the lead vocal is reverbed um, and echoed um, so it's wet with an echo delay you still have the wah rhythm guitar coming in here um, there's a slight rhythmic pattern going on a staccato synth note is playing the E bass note instead of the piano uh, this time it's it's a staccato synth part okay let's take a look at the chordal structure of this quiet interlude part um, starting at three minutes and two seconds into the song. I call it scene 10. Um, we essentially have an E minor 9 chord here, but the guitar is only playing it from the B, the low B, upwards. So he's not, the guitar is not playing the E in the bass. Okay, so that's a B with an E, an open G, a high D on the third, typical, and and F sharp on the first string. And the staccato synth is playing this part. So let's have a listen to that from three minutes and two seconds into 321. Here we go. See how the drum kit is keeping the beat steady. You hear the synth pad underlying and uh, the vocal effects and the uh, very neat chord there. But we're still not far away from the E minor. We're still in the world of the E minor. Now, moving on here, scene 11. Uh, we have a break, a first break, which leads to a second break, 
and then we go into the chorus again. Very interesting. So after the interlude and the Peter Gabriel and the quiet part, we have a break. So that's kind of strange from a organizational structural standpoint when you think about it. I think what's really interesting in this in this part particularly is how the string section comes in and it's pan far right, okay? It's in the distance, but it's still kind of an orchestral sense. Uh, you have a high female vocal coming in way in the distance at the end. But the other thing I like to uh, talk about here in this scene is the chordal structure here. It seems as though we're trying to build up and get into a happy moment. But unfortunately, as you know, by the title of the song, we're kind of in this world of uh, anomaly. So in terms of the chordal structure of this part, uh, we start off with an A minor. In a sky full of people, in a sky full of people, only some want to fly. Isn't that crazy? That's A minor, B, A minor. That's A minor seven to B minor seven to C major seven. In a sky full of people, only some want to fly. Isn't that crazy? C major seven with a G in the bass. And then D with an A in the bass. And then the bass drum, the bass and the drums are going to kick in shortly in the next scene. Okay, scene 12 is really where the bass and the drums return. They kick in, they pick up the groove. So the volume gets louder again. Have some background vocals in the distance. Uh, very cool effects. Uh, you can you give that a listen when you get a try. Um, I have them highlighted here. Uh, the vocal effects here. Uh, they're really essentially reverb and delays and uh, so that gives a sense of distance. The organ circular R pattern LFO suite come, comes back in so we're building up again here uh, towards another another chorus. Um, scene 13 is the chorus again it's repeating the scene from scene 8. The only difference this time is that the you have background vocals there's you know crazy um, in the far distance okay so that's an added part and those background vocals are kind of random uh, they're appearing in uh, randomly in the distance here pans uh, right center left and left so that's kind of makes it different from scenes six and eight as well the rest of it is pretty much has the same arrangement structure as the earlier chorus okay in scene 14 we have a very important scene because it's really very very different it's really kind of like all the instruments are out here except for the percussion you have a heavy bass note and the piano but it's really reverse cymbals again it's kind of reminiscent of the peter gabriel part but this time there's no other instruments except the percussion, which is the drum kit, the shaker, the ethnic world toms, and you have the heavy bass note and the low piano. So let's give that a brief lift. Listen, that's 449. It's about 10 seconds long, starting at 449. Here we go. <laughs> You hear that ethnic, it's just really heavy percussion driving home, and you, but you still have the scene 15 is uh, a quiet part again, um, very similar to what happens after the Peter Gabriel part earlier, a similar kind of transition. You think you're going to get a resolution here, you think the song is going to end then the bass and the drums kick in again. So it's kind of like there's still some life in the song. The center stage part is the flange guitar. Again, we have an E minor 9. It's a lower volume part. Um, same as scene 9, but shorter. This time, the emphasis is the flanged electric guitar strumming coming in. Um, playing essentially an E minor 9. That same chord that we talked about earlier. The organ arc is coming in again. Now Trevor Horn could have faded out the song right here on this guitar chord like this you know continue
continued strumming and a fade out, um, but he doesn't. Instead, uh, we hear the bass and the drums kick in again. There's one more uh, bit of uh, life in the song, if you will. Everything mm -hmm. you have the wah guitars in the on the left, and everything else pretty much the same uh, as the build up in the original verse verses. Um, so the the drums and the kick in here one last time. <laughs> By the way, that chord there from the E minor 9 is uh, an A suspended that's played up here. That's um, an A, a D, an E, and an A. So that's an A sus chord. Okay, and the last scene of the song, the notable parts is that we don't have any more drums. Uh, we're quieting down somewhat, so the volume dynamics are quieting down at the end of the song to about six and a half on a scale of one to ten. Exit the drums and the synth pad. The bass keeps pulsing along in the background, and the organ arp is finally trailing out, fading out, but it's still there. Uh, so we still have the pulse going. Uh, we have some echoed reverb delay on the far where, you know, someday, someday, someday. There's a delay and a reverb, an echo going on. Far, pan far right. We end on the E minor 9 chord, um, uh, which does not suggest resolution of any sort. So we're not dealing with any sort of cadence. Uh, it's just a fade out as if there's some things that have been unresolved and there are according to the message of the song um, so we don't get any harmonic resolution we fade out instead with a heavy delay on the background vocals someday some way some way along with the present um, the ever-present organ circular arp uh, pattern fading out in the distance so um, and that's the way we end the song. Uh, so I'll let you uh, listen to it. Um, at the final tab, we have a list of all the effects that were covered, and you can refer to this uh, in the spreadsheet. This list of uh, special effects will appear, um, you know, this whole spreadsheet actually, once again, will appear as a link. You can download it uh, underneath the video here in the, in the description of the video. So. Um, that's pretty much it. I'll let the song play out and uh, hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, uh, please subscribe. Let me know what you think and share it with your friends. Thank you so much. This is Ricky Molina from the Ricky Molina channel. Hope to see you again. Thank you.